our psalm this morning, we've already been thinking about how victory and salvation are found in God alone. And our next song continues to talk about that. So let's um, continue to praise God for um, the victory and salvation we found in him. And we'll stand and sing together.
thank you that in you there is salvation, Father. And we pray you would help us to build our lives upon you, upon your word, and upon what you've done for us. Just be with Stephen now as he brings your word. and Give us ears to hear, minds to understand, and hearts to be changed by what you'll teach us. Amen. My thanks to uh, Callum uh, and to the team for leading us uh, in worship and for uh, James in the, in the service. Now, would you turn in your Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes? We've been working through Ecclesiastes. We come to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. We have Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. It would be helpful if you would open your Bible and follow from the text. One of the values of an expository ministry is that it's the Bible itself that, is, uh, that drives us and that we consider. And I want you to follow it through so that you know that everything that I say is actually from uh, the Bible. So Ecclesiastes chapter 10 and verse 1. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense. He says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves and horses, and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt, Uh, and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. The words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. The beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. A fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him? The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child, and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility, and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. Through sloth the roof sinks in, and through indolence the house leaks. Bread is made for laughter, and wine gladdens life, and money answers everything. Even in your thoughts do not curse the king, nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature will tell the matter. Amen. And we know God always blesses the reading of His own inspired Word. The theme of Ecclesiastes chapter 10 is wisdom and folly with the accent on folly. Right through the passage, there is this contrast between the wise man and the fool. Indeed, one commentator entitles this chapter on this uh, section, The Anatomy of a Fool. Now, right at the beginning of our study, I think it's important to point out that in the Bible, wisdom and folly are spiritual and moral categories. They have nothing to do with qualifications, and you cannot measure them with IQ with an IQ test. They have nothing to do with intelligence, cleverness, or even wit. It's all to do with your relationship with God. So, for example, in the book of Proverbs chapter 9 and verse 10, we read, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. According to the Bible, you don't begin to be wise until you come to know God, and the more you know God, the wiser you become. A wise man is a man who knows God and lives accordingly. And that's why it's so significant that nowhere in the Bible is wisdom attributed to an unbeliever. The fool, on the other hand, is an unbeliever. It's the fool, according to Psalm 14 in verse 1, who says in his heart, 
that there is no God. The fool, he is an unbeliever, and an unbeliever is a fool. He is one who doesn't bring God into his reckoning or God into his thinking. That's the biblical picture of a fool. He's not intellectually deficient so much as spiritually deficient. There are some very intelligent fools. That's how we are to understand the categories of wisdom and foolishness as we come to Ecclesiastes chapter 10. The wise man knows God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is uh, insight. The fool, on the other hand, says in his heart, there is no God. And what we have in Ecclesiastes chapter 10 is the portrait of a fool. The preacher is contrasting the wise man with the fool in order to show us uh, what a fool is. Now, I want to look at the passage under four headings, and the first thing I want you to notice is the extent of foolishness. In Ecclesiastes chapter 10, we have all kinds of people described as fools. You have rulers and slaves, kings and servants, laborers, snake charmers, uh, drunkards, rich men, poor men, beggar men, thief. All are here. In our last study, we were uh, and we notice that death is no respecter of persons, and here Solomon tells us that foolishness is no respecter of persons. It can be seen in the highest and lowest of places, in the echelons of power and in the lowest strata of society. It's there to see. Now, remember, we're not talking about intelligence, but uh, about the spiritual and moral condition of people. We have it in royalty. We have a, a new king who married his mistress, who talks to plants, and ha, has told us that the Quran is more ecologically friendly than the Bible, and he is head of the Church of England. God help the Church of England. Um, at the other hand, we have, uh, on the other hand, at the other end of the scale, we have New Age travelers who are homeless, jobless, and will dance round naked Stonehenge in an attempt to be one with nature. We have academics in universities who spiritually cannot tie their own shoelaces, and we have children dropping out of school at 14 to have children. That's what Solomon says. Look at verse 15. The toil of a fool wearies him, for he does not know the way to the city. He has he is directionless. He is, has no moral compass. Here is a man immersed in his work, and he cannot find his way to time. Now, remember, uh, this is him spiritually. He, he is uh, industrious. He works hard. He is uh, intelligent, but he doesn't know his spiritual ABCs. He cannot read the signposts. He is directionally and spiritually challenged. And you see that in the professing church, don't you? You have bishops who deny the resurrections, and you have clerics who run off with their secretaries. Foolishness knows no boundaries. I was listening to a radio program at the beginning of the new year, and a panel of experts were there and informed us, the listeners, that 2023 is the year of the rabbit 2022 was the year of the tiger, and 2021 was the year of the ox, and it was, they were discussing how people born in those particular years will display those particular characteristics of those animals. It's just nonsense, and yet people will believe that rather than accept the God of the Bible. People religiously will consult the stars in the morning papers for guidance and direction, yet the God who uh, put the stars in space and has revealed Himself in His Word is ignored. In a survey published uh, just last week uh, on the most significant influential religious people in the nation, uh, Stormzy was number one, Ed Sheeran was number two, Greta Thornburg was number three, Meghan Markle was number four, and Carrie Simmons, the mistress and then the wife of Boris Johnson, was number five. You find this uh, in the uh, 
world of politics, don't you? It's, it's now politically incorrect to speak of a pregnant woman. You have to speak of pregnant, a pregnant person. You know, at this very moment in King's College in London, there are a group of researchers working on a program to try to develop a process where a man can give birth to a baby. Well, every child in primary school knows that girls and boys are different and that mummies have babies and daddies don't. Foolishness. It permeates every part of society. Now, those, you may say, uh, are extreme examples. They're only a fraction of, of our society overall. But that's Solomon's point in verse 1. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench. So, a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. Perfume in the ancient world uh, came in the form of an ointment, which, of course, uh, attracted flies. And it would only take one or two flies to get into the ointment to die and spoil the smell. In a hot climate, the decomposing bodies would mask uh, the beautiful sweet smell uh, of the, the, the perfume uh, with the stench of death. And Solomon says it just takes a little bit of foolishness, a small minority who embrace this kind of foolishness, and it permeates uh, all of society. And what is true collectively is true uh, individually. One rude word, one nasty remark, one lusty decision, one uh, foolish pleasure, one angry outburst, and everything is destroyed. Uh, John Profumo, Cecil Parkinson, Aris Robinson, Matt Hancock. People remember those people not for their achievements, but for their moral failures. And you see that with David. His sin with Bathsheba ruined his reputation, and he never fully got over the consequences of his actions. That's what Solomon says. It just takes a little bit of sin, a little bit of foolishness to ruin a community, a society, and to ruin your life. Derek Kinder says it's easier to make a stink than to create sweetness. How many marriages have been broken by moments of madness? How many ministries have been ended by moral lapses? How many reputations sullied by uncontrolled appetites? Just a little bit of folly and a whole reputation is ruined, dead flies give perfume a bad smell. That's the extent of foolishness. It doesn't take a lot of foolishness, just a little foolishness to destroy the whole thing. The extent of foolishness. The second thing I want you to notice is the evidence of foolishness. Solomon would tell us that this foolishness is all around us, and we only have to open our eyes to see it. He lists three ways in which this foolishness is revealed. First of all, it's revealed when social conventions are broken. Look at verses 5 uh, to 7. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were, an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is, folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves." Solomon speaks of a, of a ruler who puts fools in high positions, and those who were qualified uh, for the office, they occupy the low positions. He is speaking of role reversals. People who ought to have been in office are, appointed, are, are, are not appointed to office, and people who ought not to be in office are appointed uh, to office. Solomon's point is that fools are to be identified by the breaking of social conventions. Look at what he says in verse 7. I have seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like uh, slaves. If we updated that language, we might say, I saw uh, the chauffeur sitting in the back of the Rolls Royce and the, the boss driving him around. There's a, a breaking through of the norms of social convention, and we see that in our generation, social conventions regarding men and women. 
You have women dressing like men, a man dressing like women. Uh, you have non-binary people, uh, people that it's hard to distinguish whether they are men or women. People like Julian Clary and Boy George, like Eddie Izzard or Harry Styles, who wears a skirt so he can make it on to the front of Time magazine. That's an evidence of the foolishness in our society, a breaking through of social conventions, or the whole pop a punk rock movement where it was the rage to wear bin liners to dye your hair pink and put a safety pin in your nose. That kind of usurping of social convention is a, an evidence of spiritual and moral declension in society. I suppose it's to be mostly seen in the breakdown of the traditional family. Teacher of P5 asked her pupils to complete a sentence with the words, I wish, I wish, dot, dot, dot. And she expected that wish list to include a, a, a bicycle, a dog, or a holiday. Instead, 20 of the 30 children made references to their disintegrating families. I wish that my father would come home. I wish I had a, a, a mum and one dad. I wish my mummy hadn't a boyfriend. I, I wish I had a submachine gun to shoot all those who make fun of my mummy's girlfriend. Children from one parent families now represent 40% of all children in the United Kingdom. And that breakdown in the family is evidence of the foolishness that's all around us. We have TV programs now that not only um, uh, promote, seek to promote homosexuality, but seek to normalize homosexuality. When I was a, a teenager, uh, homosexuality was in the, the closet, and now it's in the display cabinet. You can't, you can't turn on the television without some homosexual relationship being betrayed. So, that's the first evidence of foolishness. Conventions are broken. Secondly, speeches destructive. You see it there in verses 12 to 14. It was Jesus who said that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, the condition of a man's heart reveals itself through his mouth, what he says, how he talks. Now, this is Solomon's point here in verses 12 to 14, that a fool will be revealed in his speech. His words are destructive. You see that in verse 13, the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is evil madness. There's just a, 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 an evil uh, um, tendency, a speech that pours out of his mouth. His words are plentiful. Uh, verse 14, a, a fool multiplies words, though no man knows what is to be, and who can tell him what will be after him. This man can't be be spoken to. He can't be reasoned with. He just pours out his words. His words are many. His words are plentiful. It takes two years um, to teach a child to talk. It takes 70 years to teach them to keep their mouths shut. His words are destructive. His words are plentiful. Uh, they're uh, indiscreet. Look at verse 20. Even in your thoughts do not curse the king nor in your bedroom curse the rich, for a bird of the air will carry your voice, or some winged creature will tell the matter. This is where we, we get that, uh, that phrase, uh, a little bird told me. A little bird, be careful. These people talk behind people's backs, not realizing that their words carry and are, are carried to the source of the person who was uh, spoken about. And ultimately, those words uh, destroy the individual. Look at verse 12, the words of a wise man's mouth win him favor, but the lips of a fool consume him. Leopold, a German commentator, translates that, the lips of a fool bring about his own undoing. He reveals himself by his words and, uh, and reveals how reckless and ungracious he really is. So, the, it, it, this foolishness is, is ref, uh, revealed in destructive words. And then thirdly, responsibilities are avoided in verses 16 to 18. 
Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of nobility and your princes feast at the proper time for strength and not for drunkenness. The NIV uh, translates verse 14, uh, uh, whose king is a servant, but I think the better translation is whose king was a child. A boy had come to the throne, but he was incompetent when it came to rule. In verses 16 to 17, he's betrayed as staying up all night with his friends, getting drunk, and then eating, feasting all day. He's a, a man who lacks any sense of responsibility. He has great privilege and a great office, but he just indulges himself. It's a bit like the student that goes off to university and drinks all night and sleeps all day, missing his lectures. It's a bit like Boris Johnson holding his parties at number 10. It's a bit like um, Benidorm. We're just back from Benidorm, and, and young people will go out clubbing all night, foam parties, foam parties where they spray them with foam. And uh, at my walk early in the morning, about seven or eight o'clock, they were staggering home to go to bed. No sense of responsibility. Look at, uh, look at verse 8. Uh, verse 18, sorry, verse 18. Um, through sloth, the roof sinks in, and through indolence, the house le leaks. Here he is again, and he just allows his house to go to rack and ruin. Now, do you see what the problem is? He just lacks all sense of responsibility. He couldn't care less. He lives a self-indulgent, self-centered life, and he doesn't care, and he doesn't worry about anyone else. Now, do you, you not see this all around us? Lager lights, absent fathers, promiscuous mothers, no sense of responsibility. I remember one of the most tragic funerals that I had to do was of a young woman who was living with her boyfriend, and they had uh, three children, and uh, she trusted the Lord just, just before she died, and they asked me to, to do the funeral, and uh, then they invited me back to the house afterwards, and there wasn't one stick of furniture in the house. They had sold it all, and the children were running around in nappies. And in the center of the, 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 the living room was a mountain of drink. And uh, he said, oh, we just wanted to send her off with a smile. Foolishness. Foolishness. That's the description of a fool, the evidence of foolishness. Social conventions are broken. Speech is destructive. Responsibilities are avoided. Now, we have to say that this country is full of fools, not intellectually, but morally and spiritually. The evidence of foolishness, the, uh, the extent of foolishness, the evidence of foolishness, the essence of foolishness. What is this foolishness? Well, look at verses 8 to 11. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. These verses describe foolish behavior. A man builds uh, digs a pit in verse 8, but he, he doesn't put a fence around it, and he comes out one night in the dark, and he falls into it. He doesn't take the necessary precautions. A man is knocking down a wall and is bitten by a snake. Snakes often made their nests in the crevices and corners of walls. This man was overconfident. He didn't look ahead. A man is breaking up stones or cutting logs, but he's not wearing the proper protective clothing, and a splinter flies off and injures him. In verse 10, there's a man cutting up wood with an unsharpened axe, and he wonders why it's taking so long and why is it expending so much energy. There in verse 11, he speaks of a snake charmer who is bitten by a snake. As long as the music is played, the snake is safe because it is mesmerized by the vibrations coming from the instrument. The snake, of course, has no ears. It's the vibrations that calms it. But this man grasps the snake before it is charmed and is bitten. 
Now, here in these five little cameos, the fool is described to us. And the thing that unites these five incidents uh, together is that the individual doesn't look ahead. He doesn't take precautions. He doesn't think of consequences. He digs a pit, but he doesn't put the yellow triangle up to warn of the danger. He breaks down a wall without checking for snakes. We might use the equivalent. He doesn't uh, bring the experts in to check if asbestos is present, or he doesn't switch off the electricity before he changes the plug. He quarries stone and uh, chops logs without putting on goggles. He chops wood without sharpening the axe, and he grabs a snake without charming it. I don't know a modern equivalent of that. And he is a fool. The fool is one who doesn't think about consequences. So the fool's out, and he's walking on his roof, and he sees his neighbor's wife bathing. He doesn't think of the consequences. He doesn't think of her pregnancy. He doesn't think of his family. He doesn't think of his country and his reign. And David is blinded by the thrill of the sin at that moment and fails to look beyond it. And that is the essence of foolishness, the foolishness that Solomon is speaking about. It's like those 300 whales a number of years ago that beached themselves in America. They were so focused on the tiny little shoal of sardines that they were following, they didn't realize that the beach was getting closer and the water was getting warmer and shallower. And they ended up marooned on the beach, focused on the tasty morsel without realizing the increasing danger. And you see this all the time. The adulterer, he doesn't think of the loss of his family. The young couple don't think of the inevitable pregnancy. The thief caught with his hand in the till doesn't think of the loss of his job and the humiliation it brings him in community. The murderer doesn't think of the jail sentence. Matt Hancock doesn't think of the consequence of kissing his secretary in the lift and all the scandal that results in the loss of his job. And we could go on and on with numerous examples. This is the biblical definition of a fool. He doesn't think of consequences. He doesn't think of the results of his moral actions. And you can be a politician like Matt Hancock. You can be like a bishop in Galway. You can be a, a lecturer in a, in a university who seduces one of his students, or you can be a pastor in a Baptist church, and you can be a fool. Fools don't think about moral and spiritual consequences. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And remember, um, heart, in the, particularly in the Old Testament, is the center of the will. It's, it's the center of our, our, our being. And, and the fool is one who acts without reference, takes decisions without reference to God, exercises his will without God in the picture. Now, the supreme example of that kind of foolishness is given by Jesus. Remember the man in Luke chapter 12, who Jesus called a fool. He was a rich farmer. He pulled down his barns, and he built bigger ones, and he said to himself, I have plenty now for life. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. Do you see why he's called a fool? He didn't think of consequences. He didn't think of the consequences of eternity. He thought only in terms of the here and the now, and never thought of the there and then. That's foolishness. Intelligent people and not so intelligent people will go through life and never think of the consequences of their actions for the life to come. Are you a fool? You may have all your GCSEs. You may have your A-levels. You may have um, a university degree. But are you a biblical fool? 
one who doesn't think of consequences. You see the sin, but not the suffering. You see the excitement, but not the effects. You see the enjoyment, but not eternity. Do you ever think of the long-term consequences of your actions? A life without Christ will take you to hell. Do you ever think about that? If you don't think about that, you're a fool, not my words, but the words of God. You fool. Tonight, your soul will be required of you. That's the essence of foolishness, the extent of foolishness, the evidence of foolishness, the essence of foolishness. And lastly, and quickly, the explanation of, uh, of foolishness. Why is man like this? Why is he such a foolish, foolish creature? Well, the answer is given to us in verse 2. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Now, Margaret Thatcher loved this verse. She put it on her letterheads. Um, uh, a, a wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. But it has nothing to do with politics. There are as many fools in the conservative right as the loony left. In the ancient world, the right hand was considered to be the place of power and honor. It's associated with strength, salvation, and protection, while the left hand was uh, connected or associated with weakness and deceit. So, the English word sinister comes from a Latin word that means on the left hand, and our English word dexterity comes from uh, the Latin on the right hand. So, what Solomon is saying is the heart of the fool is inclined to evil. In other words, the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. And remember, heart in Scripture is the inner man. It's, it's the, 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 the mind. One of the Puritans uh, described um, the heart of man as the, the, the mind that is ridden by two, two riders, uh, emotion and, and will. And what Solomon is saying is there's this tendency in us to this kind of foolishness. Our hearts incline to evil. And that's the testimony of the Bible, isn't it? There is no one righteous, says Paul. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks God all have turned aside. Do you remember at the flood, God's diagnosis of the human condition was that uh, man's wickedness was great, and the inclination of his heart was to evil all the time. That there is this bias like a bowling ball that always takes us to the left, that always takes us to evil, that always takes us to what is wrong that our wills are corrupted, that we, we will always choose the sinful path. And what's the solution? And what's the remedy? Well, the remedy is a new will and a new heart. We need this, this heart of ours, this deceitful heart, this heart that's inclined to evil. We need it taken away, and we need that heart of stone removed and a heart of flesh transplanted. We, we need a new nature within us that doesn't take us to the left, that doesn't incline us to evil, that doesn't make bad choices, foolish choices all the time, but that inclines us to the right and to what is right. That's what, what Jesus said, um, a man must be born again. Why, why must a man be born again? Well, he needs to be born again because flesh gives birth to flesh. That, that there's, there's something uh, in us that always takes us towards the sinful, to the inappropriate, to the foolish. But the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. And when a person is born again, God implants a new nature into him and gives him new desires uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, enables him then to choose what is right and what is holy, and what is, is wise. And the question then I, I want to ask you then is, are you a fool? Are you a fool? Morally, are you a fool? 
Do you always just choose what is wrong? Do you incline towards what is right to the flesh, to all that is unholy and unwholesome and wrong and displeasing to God? Or have you that new nature, that new heart transplanted into you that comes from above, that's at like a new birth, a, a new beginning, a, a new start, a new life, new nature is planted within you that enables you then to make wise choices and right choices. I sometimes, like David, you're blinded by the, the temptation like um, the, the, for, uh, for the sin at that particular moment, but you, when you do sin, you're full of remorse, and you, 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 you realize that was wrong, and it drives you back to Jesus again and again to that fountain that is open for sin and uncleanness, and, uh, um, and like the hymn writer, you taste afresh the calm of sins forgiven. Are you a fool? Do you think about consequences? If God should reach into your chest and put His hand on your heart at this very moment and stop that heart beating and take you into eternity, where would you be? You've got to think of, of consequences. You've got to think of heaven. You've got to realize that you're in time for eternity, and you need to make those preparations for eternity. The extent of foolishness that affects every part of society. It only takes a little bit of um, foolishness to corrupt a society or to corrupt an individual. A dead fly in ointment spoils the smell. The evidence of a foolishness with us all around us. Conventions are broken. Speech is destructive. Words are, are harsh. People say, you know, I'm just blunt, you know, but a blunt knife can do great damage, and responsibilities are avoided. The essence of foolishness. A fool is a person who doesn't think of consequences, and the explanation of foolishness. There is this inclination, this, um, this uh, desire to take the, the foolish path. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. Uh, we thank You for its challenge, and we help, pray, O oh God, that You'd help us to examine our lives in the light of it. We want to be wise. We want to make good choices. We want to make uh, God-glorifying choices in our lives, and we pray, O oh God, that that You would, first of all, plant this new nature within us, that You would give us a new heart that doesn't incline to the left, but inclines to what is right, and that You would help us when faced with these choices throughout life to make good choices, always thinking of the consequences of those choices. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand and sing together.
may be seated. 